I am sure that many have, of you have seen on bumpers of cars stickers that read, I'd rather be fishing. Now, truthfully for me, it's not fishing that I'd rather be doing. I'd rather be cycling. But I understand, I really understand the appeal of fishing. I, I used to do it a lot when I was a kid uh, at Paul's Lake where I could catch bluegills and sunfish and my least favorite, catfish. There was something even then when I was younger relaxing about fishing and something calming. It was almost meditative. Many people find fishing to be somewhat of a zen experience. Unless, of course, you do fishing for a living. And that was the case for Andrew, Peter, James, and John. They didn't fish because they wanted to get away from it all. They didn't fish because they wanted to lose themselves in nature. They fished because that's how they brought home the bacon. They fished because fam fishing was the family business. And for them, fishing was hard work. Nets were heavy. The weather could be cruel. The fish were unreliable. And on top of all of that, and this is the very significant thing, they had to deal with the Romans, the nasty Romans. The Romans controlled the waterways, and they controlled the fishing rights. They made money off of the boats they rented to fisher folk. They taxed just about every aspect of the fishing process. And so the work of the fishermen often didn't benefit the fishermen so much as it did the Roman bigwigs, like Herod Antipas, the guy who put John into jail. He was the beneficiary of all their work. To fish for a living was to participate in a horribly oppressive industry. It was, as Sarah Dillon says, no day at the beach. So I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Could this have explained why Peter and all the others were so willing to leave behind their fishing job? Anything was better than having to deal with those nasty, oppressive Romans. And besides, Jesus must have been a much better boss than Herod. Yeah, there's no doubt that following Jesus is tough stuff. When James and John left their boat and their father, they were leaving behind everything which brought them security, that which oriented their lives, that which helped them pay their bills and provide for their families. They were letting go of all that they knew, of that which gave them a place in the world and a sense of honor among other people. And so when Jesus said, follow me, and they followed, life would never, ever be the same again. Life would be much riskier, more unpredictable, and probably harder. Discipleship of Jesus is no easy business. Yet, think about it. Think about who's leading this movement. Think about who your new boss is. It's not Herod. It is Jesus, although boss is probably not the right word to describe Jesus. In his movement, life doesn't seem to be about hierarchies, boss and employee. In fact, he's known for saying in his world, the last are first and the first are last. In his movement, hierarchies seem to be eliminated. Everybody's in this together. Oh, it isn't as if there isn't leadership in this movement. And that sounds quite appealing to many of us. Quite a few of us Americans are known for saying that we want to be our own bosses. And I, as a somewhat independent sort, get that. Yet the Jesus movement is not leaderless. To follow him is in some ways to submit to him. But we are not submitting to a force that keeps us in bondage, that makes us pawns in someone else's oppressive economy. We are not submitting to Herod. Rather, we are submitting to that which takes us into the land of freedom. We're submitting to a love that actually sets us free. But yes, we must admit, that love, this Jesus who sets us free, turns the world as we know it upside down. 
And that is precisely what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians today when he writes the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For Paul, for Paul, the message of the cross is part and parcel of what the life of Jesus and the whole movement are about. And Paul says to the world, that is to most folks, the cross looks like foolishness. The cross looks like failure, the very opposite of what we want our lives to be about. But Paul claims, for those who get it, those who understand, the cross is a new kind of power, a new kind of freedom. The cross, if you will, creates its own economy, a different way of organizing life. When the cross is at the center, life isn't about perfection or achievement, or accomplishment, or climbing somebody's ladder when the cross is at the center. Life is not about avoiding other people's pain, lying about your real life, hiding the truth about yourself, or avoiding any kind of vulnerability. No, in the economy of Jesus, weakness can be indeed be strength. Vulnerability can be a means for connecting to others. Failure can be a way for us to get in touch with our true humanity. When the cross is at the center, and here's Paul's point today, unity is what we will experience. When perfection, getting everything right, Achievement, success, money, popularity are at the center. Disunity is guaranteed. But when we're all brought to our common humanity, when we're all knocked off our high horses, when we all see, as Luther says, that before the cross we are beggars, we then are knitted together in one human family. So, this is what comes to light when we respond to Jesus' call, follow me. We're brought into a whole new economy, a whole new way of operating, a whole new way of thinking, a whole new way of acting. When Jesus, what shapes life in the Jesus movement is the cross, suffering love, compassionate love that isn't about winning or justifying yourself at the expense of other people. No, it's about that which binds us together, that which unifies us, that which takes us out of our little tribes that are often the sources for our division and weaves us into one common humanity. Obviously, this Jesus economy is ultimately about people. It's not about profit. It's not about scorekeeping. It's not about success. It's about people. I don't know how many of you have seen the uh, movie that's out right now called A Man Called Otto. If you haven't, you need to see this movie. It is tremendous. Uh, the movie's about a crabby man. And I've been thinking a lot about crabby people lately, and so the movie just sort of fit into what I'd been thinking about. <laughs> it's all about a crabby man who, everything that everybody does bugs him because they don't follow the rules. They're, not, they're parking in the wrong place. They're going too fast. You know, you know how the list, you can create your own list of crabbiness activities. You, all these things he's crabby about, and he is a pain to be around, a real pain. The movie, it's about things like suicide and it's, it's about uh, things like grief because we find out that the guy is really crabby because he's grieving. He's grieving the loss of his wife and he's grieving the loss of his uh, baby, so he has every right to be crabby. But you know what happens in this movie? I don't want to give it away and I won't give it away, but um, <laughs> what happens in the movie is this man gets connected to community, the neighborhood. A neighborhood of wild and wacky people. And slowly, the man is transformed because of people. This Jesus movement is primarily about people. It's about hearing the world's cries, sharing in the pain and joy of others, and it's about responding to the deep longings of human hearts. Follow me and I will make you fish for people. To be a part of his movement is to be driven by a concern for people. 
Now, I think some Christians, when they hear the call for us to fish for people, have an image of a big fishing line with a hook on the end of it that we're supposed to use to bring people into the boat that we own. The Christian's task is to get people one way or another, even if they would rather stay in the water, into the boat. A a disciple's task, you know, is to catch souls for Jesus. Now, I have to admit, this is not normally a Lutheran problem. You know, we're pretty shy. We're pretty shy when it comes to sharing Jesus with other folks. And maybe that's because of the way that others have approached this evangelism task. The task is not to hook people by the mouth to get them into the church one way or another. Remember, remember what is at the center of the Jesus movement is the cross. And when that is at the center, coercion or browbeating are never our tactics. The task is not to coerce. The task simply is to invite. The task is to listen. The task is to share in human pain. The task is to ask what Jesus asked last week in John, or what he said, come and see. Come and see. Come and experience what we experience. Come and encounter a whole new economy. Come and encounter a world where hierarchies are gone and where freedom is experienced. Come and leave behind oppressive economies that many of us, many of you live in. Come and experience freedom and grace and love and forgiveness. Now, no doubt there's a letting go that must happen when you follow Jesus. There's a lot that you need to let to leave behind when you connect to this Jesus movement. But you got to get this. What you receive from this movement is so good. It is life-changing, world-altering, community-shaping. The economy of Jesus is a world of great freedom. And when you come down to it, it's actually a world of great fun. So, I think I'd rather be fishing with Jesus. Amen.